All right. Well, welcome, everybody. Welcome to the Photography Happy Hour. Um, I'm your host, Mike Wardinsky, and thank you guys for, for joining us today. Uh, I'm really excited. I've got the incredibly talented Max Foster with me today, and we're going to kind of do a deep dive into um, um, both landscape photography and his work uh, specifically. A little bit about me, if, uh, if you're not familiar, um, as again, again, I mentioned my, my name is Mike Wardinsky. I'm a working landscape photographer and I do about 20 to 30 photography workshops per year, both public and private. Um, I have an online gallery at naturemike.com. I'll pull that up for you guys here right real quick. And um, in addition to workshops and gallery, I also maintain a blog. Um, you can see right here under articles. If you click on that, you, you'll find all sorts of how-to articles and both, um, and not only how-to articles, but also uh, fine art um, photography articles as well. I, um, if you wanna see what my newest articles are, you can click over to news and that'll be a list of my latest articles. And it's also where you can go in the future to find out when I'm doing the next photography happy hour, because let's face it, I'm not that prepared for these things. And um, I generally kind of take them as they, as they come. So generally I try and do one every month or two. And as of right now, I don't have my next date, but uh, just kind of check back again, naturemike.com, go to news. And you can see here's the one for today posted right there. But that's enough about me. I want to I want to talk about Max and and his work. So I'm going to click over to his website and show you um, some of his work here. Um, and as I mentioned, incredibly talented photographer. I, th I think Max is one of the, the best landscape photographers out there right now. Um, his work is incredibly clean. It's um, it's it's vibrant, but not over the top, which is what I love about it. And the compositions are, you know, they're right on, on point. So I'll just kind of scroll through, down here so you can kind of see some of his different uh, works and kind of some of the different places that he's been um, photographing. So this is a photography happy hour. So before we dive into the photography aspect, of course, we, we got to have a cheers here. And one thing I forgot to, to mention about Max um, his website is maxfosterphotography.com. Also, if you're not following him on Instagram, make sure you do so. Um, same same uh, handle as his website, Max Foster Photography. Um, and there'll be plenty of uh, fresh and beautiful photographs for you to kind of scroll through there. Um, if you're not following me, it's Nature Mike. If you just do a search for Nature Mike, you'll, you'll find me. But um, anyway, let's uh, let's do a little cheers here. I want to, I want to, point out my drink here it's uh it looks a little weird it's it's green it's um i gotta give credit to my fiance she invented this thing and i'm i'm actually gonna read you the uh the recipe so if you don't get anything out of this at all at least you get this this beautiful recipe right here uh, which is one part mezcal two parts pineapple juice a pinch of jalapeno pinch of cilantro um a squeeze of lime with a chili lime salted rim, and then you put that in a blender and blend it all up. Not, not the glass, obviously, um, but it is absolutely delicious. And I'll send you guys an email at, once we get done here and kind of recap some of the stuff we talk about. And I'll also send you this, this recipe. Um, Max, what are you sipping on over there? Well, first off, I gotta say next time, maybe I should come over there and uh, we'll have drinks together and uh, we can make the drinks. Cause that looks <laughs> I'm in. Anytime. Uh, actually, mine is uh, only very small amount of alcohol. It's actually uh, kombucha. I don't know if Ooh. you're familiar with kombucha, but uh, it's fermented tea uh, with fruit juice, and uh, I'm kind of addicted to it. So that's what I'm drinking today. It's only like 0.5% alcohol, but there's a little in there. So. <laughs> All right. Cheers. Cheers, everybody. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm actually, I'm a absolute kombucha fiend. Every time I go to the store, I'm trying to like, oh, there's a new one. I like trying different brands, different flavors. Uh, I tend to stick to the, my favorite though, is like the ginger, um, uh, lemon ginger is kind of my, my go-to. Same here. I like it when it's nice and zippy. I actually tried to make it in my house once. I got this big jug, uh, 
grew my own scoby and uh you know it turned out all right but it is way too much work so i'm like i'm just gonna buy it from now on <laughs> it's, it's on my list of things to do my bucket list of, of brewing kombucha did you get fruit flies i didn't no okay that's my, my fiance kind of she won't let me because she's worried about the fruit flies but maybe maybe i'll be like well max didn't get any let me try it <laughs> well cool well well thanks so much for for joining me, Max, I, I really appreciate it. And um, it's always a pleasure to talk to you. I think the last time we saw each other was in um, in Yosemite at, at, at uh, Tunnel View, is that right? Yeah, 2019, I believe, so it's been a while. And uh, since then, you had a little baby. Yeah, she was born on July 1st, so she is still pretty young and fresh, and we're learning all about how to be good parents, but it's been a blast, we're having a lot of fun. So. You um, my red eyes. I don't get much sleep these days. But. I was about to ask how much how much sleep you're getting. <laughs> Not as much as I would like, but it's all part of the game. So. Right. Well, well, great. Uh, well, let's just kind of dive in here. I got a kind of a list of some questions to to ask you. And uh, first off, um, how long have you been shooting, and and how did you get into shooting in the in the first place? Yeah, so I've been shooting for maybe about nine years now. So I guess not that long, really. I, I guess I'm still kind of a rookie in that sense, but um, seems like a long time. Um, I got into photography uh, kind of not directly uh, because of a, an interest in photography, but rather uh, my wife and I were doing a lot of traveling. And, uh, you know, we would go out to these cool places and I'd get back home and review my photos and realize, wow, you know, this isn't how I remembered the place. Um, just kind of disappointed by uh, the photos. So that kind of was the catalyst to learning about photography. And at you know, the very beginning, I wanted to just be technically savvy so I could go out and just get shots that looked good. They didn't have a lot of noise. They were sharp. Um, you know, my horizons were straight. Just real basic stuff like that. And, uh, you know, that stuff is all pretty easy to catch on to. So once that happened, uh, we kept traveling and it, I just kind of got the bug. And uh, after that, you know, the rest is kind of history. I just learned as much as I could and uh, kind of transitioned from traveling for fun to traveling for photography and making that uh, kind of the goal wherever I went. Uh, I want to go out and actually uh, plan trips around photography so I can ensure that I'm getting shots that I like. And, you know, that happened already eight, nine years ago. And um, now that's all I think about. I mean, every day I'm researching new locations. I'm dreaming of different places to go. And uh, I think that's the best thing about photography for me is just uh, getting to go out and see all these amazing places, experience new sites. Um, new challenges, all that. So that's kind of my short story. Story in that. So. Um, photography, sort of like I like to explain it as the the deep dark rabbit hole, um, where like you know you start to think about it more and more. The more you get into it, it's just like it's like where can I go next, or you know what's this place going to look like at this time of year? And then pretty soon, like it's like kind of like it's that that tunnel vision that you get um and that's I, I think one of the, the joys for people who really get hooked on it um what are your favorite types of images to create i know you're a landscape photographer but is there a specific type of image that you like to create um and uh, and why yeah you know that's changed over time and i think that's probably pretty common with anybody that's a photographer for a while uh you know interests vary over time and uh you know, I started out with more travel photography, so I was really into uh, going to Europe and doing more villages and stuff with man-made elements. Um, but then over time, that kind of transition, uh, I kind of rekindled my love of the outdoors. And now that's uh, primarily what I am focused on is landscapes, uh, no man-made elements. And for me, I think the most compelling thing about uh, photography is 
getting out there to a new place. Uh, and a lot of the time, it's a place where maybe I know a little bit about it. Uh, I've done some cursory uh, research, but not too much because I want to get out there and actually be surprised. I want to um, feel like I'm experiencing this place in the moment rather than just you know researching everything that I can about it to figure out every vantage point, every view, uh, exactly what kind of compositions I want to come up with. So that's the kind of shots that I like to do is like you get out there and you just see what the place is all about. Uh, you see what speaks to you and then you can come away with stuff that is fresh for you. And uh, it's just more unique that way, I think. So that's how I get the most enjoyment out of it. Yeah, that's a that's a good point that you brought up. Uh, the the idea of you know researching enough to kind of know where the place is and kind of what it's about, but not to the point where you're like you're going to try and copy the composition that you that you found there. Because I feel like at a certain point, like you you start chasing that. Like if you if you like research too much, you're like okay, that's the shot. I got to get that shot. Yet if you kind of you know, if you just kind of leave that out of your mind and don't even get to that point, it's a little more open and, and you might come away with something that's, you know, much better than this sort of like obvious, you know, shot that you that you know about. Right, yeah, absolutely. And, uh, you know, early on when you're just learning about photography, I think that that is pretty typical where you go out and you're like, yeah, that's the shot that I want. And I don't think there's anything wrong with that. I think that over time, though, you're just going to be uh, more fulfilled by coming up with photos that are more uniquely yours. And I found that for sure. And it's not to say that, you know, if I go to Yosemite, I'm not going to go up to Tunnelview and take a shot. Mm -hmm. uh, well, because it's awesome and it's beautiful and it's one of the best views that you can get. But I'm also going to go out and try to find some unique vantage points. So I can come away with something that I feel like is my own. Great. Um, well, wh what would you say? I mean, as as photographers, we all make a lot of mistakes, especially in the beginning. And my whole last uh, photography happy hour was basically based on mistakes that I've made. I kind of was explaining the mistakes that I made and and what I've learned from them. So I'm curious, like what. If you had to say like the biggest mistake that you made, what what would that be, and and would you would you learn from it? Uh, you know, I think early on, I thought that you could go to a location and just get the photo that you wanted. You know, it's like the, the elements just align whenever you show up, and obviously that is not the case. So, I think uh, you know I did a lot of work in post processing earlier on where. I would try to create the atmosphere or the look and feel that I thought I wanted. And at the end of the day, yeah, I mean, I, I like some of the shots, but I also feel like it kind of detached from the scene itself when I was there. Uh, it was too too processed. It, it was too, um, too overdone, I guess. So for me, that was something that took a while to learn. And, you know, every now and again, I still have to uh, step away from the computer and come back and go, oh, you know what, I think I went too far with that. So I'm going to start over or take a few steps back. And that's okay. I mean, it's all about uh, keeping your eyes fresh. But uh, for me, just making sure that I'm starting with a good solid photo, uh, one that I feel has strong elements, and then taking it to a level where I can have a creative artistic touch, but it's not detached from that reality of when I was there. So I think that was the biggest thing for me. And that's an ongoing thing. And I think it will continue to evolve over time. Uh, you know, gear and software continues to evolve. And I think that will be a challenge for people that are just getting into photography too, because now you've got so many resources on the web, everything from a tutorial on every step of post processing to replacing skies with the click of a button uh, to automated focus stacking, exposure blending, the whole works. And the question is, you know, at least for me, uh, where do I want to draw the line and actually 
remember the scene as I saw it uh, versus creating this kind of fanciful uh, image. And for me, you know, I like to keep it more on the side of reality. Uh, and sometimes, depending on the scene or the shot, I might take it to the next level just because I'm feeling creative or, you know, I want to for the heck of it. But uh, that's not the typical for me. So, and it, you know, again, it's uh, to each their own. For me, I'm not one of those uh, hardliners that's like, you know, photography is this and only this. Uh, I think each person finds their own way with it, and I'm cool with that. So, great. Yeah, I mean, yeah, you, you touched on, on a lot of points there, um, and I, I feel like you're you're right when you say it's going to be harder for folks starting off in photography just because like there almost is this formula and of course each photo is different but like you can do a lot of research online and find out a lot but it's going to be hard to carve out your own style um, as a new photographer now just because there's so many like sort of recipes out there that you can just kind of like latch onto this but um, yeah it's, it's really I think getting more difficult to, to carve out which is your own style. And talking about post-processing, um, I think at, in a digital world, we get so focused and entranced on like, you can't have, in, you know, you can't have any solid blacks or you can't have any blowouts in the highlights or you need a uh, 100% depth of field. Um, and sometimes I think it's okay to, to have that, um, those blowouts. Um, or even, um, you know, a shallower depth of field. Just, it just kind of depends, I think, on, on the image. Um, yeah, but- um, I think it depends on uh, what you plan on doing with the image. You know, most people these days, I feel like, never take their image to that physical level. It's more just posted online, it's on a website, it's viewed on their phone, it's viewed on a computer screen. But if you actually print the image, then, you know, sometimes blown out highlights or those deep dark blacks can look really good. So it really depends on what your goal is and how you want to present your image. Right, 100%. Um, if you had like one piece of advice that you had to, to give to other photographers out there, what do you think that would be? Uh, yeah, I think following your own path is important. So, you know, as you're starting out, it's good to draw inspiration from people and images and the photographers that you think are uh, the best out there. But I don't think that it's good to get into a habit of trying to copy or emulate to a degree where it's like, I need my photo to look just like this person. So I think making sure that you understand what is what is it that you want to get out of photography? What do you want your images to represent? Or how do you want to feel about that uh, collection of work when you look back at it? For me, um, you know, I want to look back at all the photos that I've taken and remember each moment that I was out there in the field, what I felt like, what I was seeing, how I uh, was, you know, all the sights and the sounds and the smells, basically everything about that image. Uh, reminds me of that. And as soon as you start trying to make your photos look like somebody else's or uh, kind of make them more on the fancy full side, then yeah, I think you kind of lose a bit of that. So yeah, um, following your own own path is important and remembering why you got into photography in the first place. Um, you know, was it to get a lot of likes on social media or was it because you enjoyed being in the outdoors? Uh, whatever it is, uh, I think is important to remember and stay true to. Great, great. Um, in your opinion, what is the most important thing um, when it comes to post processing? Because photography is kind of like, I mean, it always has been, it's kind of been two parts. There's the one, the capture, and then the, the processing, whether it be in a, in a dark room or in the digital dark room, you know, in Lightroom or Photoshop. Um, what to you, what's the most import, important part of your post-processing? Uh, you know, for me, I think the most important thing is just, I want a clean image. So I want to start with an image that 
uh, is technically good, uh, solid. So obviously I want it to be sharp where I want it to be sharp. I want it to be uh, free of noise. I want it to um, be a good solid base file. And then from there, I can do whatever I need to, to bring that photo to life. So typically for me, I start out in Lightroom. I do my basic uh, exposure adjustments, you know, bump the shadows, uh, maybe work the highlights, things like that, try to even out the exposure. Uh, I like to use the tools like the radio tool, uh, the brush tool, more local adjustments. So that way I can kind of shape the light how I want. Uh, draw the viewer's eye the parts of the image that I think are most important or most compelling. Um, and I think these days, Lightroom, you can get probably like 95% there. I mean, unless you're doing like a crazy focus stack or exposure blend, things like that, uh, you can get 95% there. And then after that, then I'll pop in Photoshop. Uh, I might do a little bit of, uh, you know, curves adjustments, things like that. Uh, but generally these days, I don't actually do too much. Um, I might uh, remove some, you know, sticks that might be in the way or like clean up an image. I like to do that. And that's part of the look that I'm after, which is uh, clean. So when you look at the shot, you don't have a bunch of clutter uh, that might be uh, distracting to the viewer. So yeah, for, for me, it's just all about clean post-process. I don't want to distract the viewer by being over the top. I just want it to be a good uh, clean image. So that's, that's it for me in a nutshell. I, th I think you hit the nail on the head when you said clean. Um, you know, a lot of times on, on workshops, uh, like I see it all the time. And it's something that I, I it took me a, a little while to learn too in the beginning is to watch out for, you know, those those sticks, like just kind of poking out of the corner of the frame. And it's it's so easy to not even see them when you're out there in the field. Or maybe it's just like, oh, like, uh, like a little you have a nice, some dark rocks and there's like one light rock and it's right in the corner. So it's gonna take your viewer's eye kind of down in, into the opposite direction that you want them to go. And of course, we all make mistakes. I still once in a while have that happen or maybe there's a situation where I can't, you know, I have the composition kind of nailed and dialed down the way I want it. And you just can't move that stick because it's in the middle of a raging river or, you know, whatever, whatever reason. Uh, but that's, that's a really good um, point that you brought up. Um, on the field too, it's like, you know, you're viewing through your camera and either the viewfinder or you're looking at a three inch screen on the back of your camera. So it's really easy to miss stuff. So, you know, you might be out there and the sky lights up and you're thinking, oh, this is only going to last for like 30 seconds. So I just got to nail this. And then, yeah, you just miss something that's totally obvious if you were taking the time. So that's something that I've struggled with, you know, as I'm sure you have too, where it's like you have to make sure even when things are happening fast that you still take your time enough so you can come away with a good quality shot. And uh, last thing with uh, post-processing, I forgot to mention, I obviously sell uh, large format prints on my website. That's kind of my main uh, end product. So in order to do that, yeah, your files do have to be clean. So I'm always thinking about shooting for print from the very beginning. Uh, you know, and then when I actually process, I'm zooming in to 300, 400% sometimes, just making sure that everything is perfect. Um, so when I do go to print that file, and it's going to be 70 inches across, that it looks perfect. And the sharpening is going to be great. And, you know, there's nothing that is going to be discovered later on. Uh, I'd rather do that up front. So, you mentioned sharpening. What's your your go to method for for sharpening? Uh, yeah. So starting out, I do capture sharpening in Lightroom, and that's pretty basic for me. Um, there's typically only like three sliders in there. So there's the amount, the radius, and the. Uh, uh, I would need it in front of me. I know what it looks like. But yeah. Right. <laughs> I can, I can shoot you a text and you can go. <laughs> um, anyway, I do my capture sharpening. And same thing there, I'm zooming into either 100 or 300%, so I can really dial in that sharpening without overdoing it. 
You know, I don't want any kind of haloing or uh, white edges, things like that. So I'll do that. And then I also uh, mask it in Lightroom. So that way you can eliminate the sharpening in the dark and bright areas. Uh, you don't want to introduce more noise and need and stuff like that. Uh, clouds don't need to be sharp. Uh, you know, dark areas don't need to be sharp. So do that. And then I'll work my uh, my standard adjustments in Lightroom and Photoshop. And then when it comes to making a print file, uh, what I typically do is make a separate uh, print file for every additional size that I'm making. So if I'm doing a 20 by 30 or a 40 by 60, each one of those has its own print file. So that way uh, it's sharpened so it looks the best at that size. And the way I sharpen is typically by using uh, a layer that is called a high pass layer. Um, and I'll do that. Uh, pretty simple adjustment. Um, basically, you just duplicate your pixel layer, you uh, turn it to overlay mode, um, the blending mode for that layer, and then you go into your uh, high pass sharpening. Fix how much you think it needs. Uh, again, you just want to be careful not to overdo it. And then I'll basically uh, merge those layers into an another, another pixel layer. And then I'll do an unchart mask layer and uh, I'll kind of mask you know, the areas that I don't think need sharpening. I'll mask that out and then just kind of dial in the amount. Uh, sometimes it requires more in certain areas and less in others. So it's really just about each image and how you want the viewer to see uh, different parts of the image. If you want to create depth, you know, maybe you want the foreground to be sharper than the background. So you want to mask out the background a little bit on um, those sharpening. So that's my basic uh, sharpening workflow. And it obviously depends on each image. And it takes a lot of practice in order to dial that in. You have to do a lot of test prints to figure out what looks good on your screen and how does that uh, translate to an actual hard, tangible printed copy. Yeah, great. I mean, I think that's a, a great thing to touch on for, for this discussion, because I think it's something that not a lot of people talk about. And it's one of the most important aspects of photography, especially if you're going to be printing, I think. Um, yeah, sharpening is key. There's about a billion different ways to do it. Um, and the, the techniques that you mentioned, uh, the unsharp mask, um, is, is one of my favorites. At one point, I, um, I actually went through and I created like this sample image and I, I, I lost it somewhere. But I created like a sample image of like about eight different ways to sharpen from Lightroom to Photoshop and all, all these different ways and like, like zoomed into 100% so you could kind of see the difference between them. Um, and yeah, like I said, I, I lost the file. So I'm sorry, everybody, you'll have to do it yourself. <laughs> Um, so speaking of, of mistakes, um, of me losing the file, what's one of the, the uh, uh, dumbest things that, you, it, it might not even be a mistake, but what's one of the dumbest things that you've ever had happen to you on a shoot, whether it be, you know, get attacked by a crocodile or a bear or whatever? No, I mean, I've been all over the place shooting in all different kinds of environments from uh, being on the water in a, a raft to on the top of a mountain, uh, you know, standing in a stream, things like that. And, you know, I'm going to knock on wood right now, but I haven't had a lot of bad stuff happen, thankfully. So I'm happy for that. But, uh, you know, kind of the, on the dumb side of things, uh, one of my favorite things that I shoot with is my tripod. I got this big, really right stuff, bad boy. You know, that's probably my favorite piece of gear. And uh, I remember I was in a stream in the Pacific Northwest a few years back. And I was surrounded by these high canyon walls. And there's just this one little area where the uh, bank came down and I was standing right there. And I had my tripod fully extended, probably like five feet deep in the water. And I'm snapping shots. And uh, anyway, I take my camera off to review some shots. And dumb me, I let go of my tripod. So all of a sudden, I look down. And there it goes. It's bobbing down the river. <laughs> and I'm just freaking out. And uh, so I quickly scramble up the, the bank and I'm running down river and I'm just watching it go and thinking, yeah, that thing's long gone. But uh, it, got, it got cut on a stick 
and, and I was able to wade out and get it. And, uh, you know, that's, you know, just a, a dumb little thing, but, um, yeah, thankfully I've never had anything bad happen or too stupid. So, um, I have lost my tripod several times and I've gotten it back every time. One time I left it on an airplane. I was, I, it was a red, red eye flight coming back from Greece and I had it in the overhead bin and I grabbed my bag and stuff and then get off and, uh, got back home, realized I don't have my tripod. And, uh, my wife and I were talking about it and we realized, yeah, we left it in the overhead bin. So. Anyway, that was quite the ordeal trying to get that back because back then I never put my name on my tripod. So trying to get something that doesn't have your name on it from the airline is always difficult. But uh, now I have my name on my tripod, which I'd recommend to everybody that travels. So 100%. I think I have. I, so I bought a, a label maker a couple of years ago, and I'm one of those crazy people who just like label everything like, I mean, like tripod, camera, uh, filters, like everything you could possibly think of has a label with my name number and email in case i'm traveling internationally because a lot of times people can't call a u.s number if you're you're if you're international so they have every pretty much every piece of gear has that that info and it's yeah it's a huge huge lifesaver i know a buddy of mine left a a, a really important hard drive on a airplane once and he never he wasn't able to get it back so you i think you're really lucky that the tripod made it back to you. <laughs> um, it's a, yeah, it's a, it's, you, it's a dangerous situation. It just kind of depends on who's cleaning the plane and what airline you're flying. I think at that point. <laughs> um, but yeah, good good points there. Um, piece of gear, and uh, I've got all these memories. You know, I've shot all of these different places with my tripod. It's like it's been everywhere with me, so I can't lose that thing. Yeah, they're they're not cheap either. Right. <laughs> um so speaking of going to different places is there a certain place that you were really like really really excited to to go to and then you got there and it was just kind of a uh, yeah okay this place actually isn't that cool like yeah maybe there's one shot and it looks good but like that's kind of like the only shot is there any place that was like a big letdown for you uh yeah you know i think for me, I've actually not had too many experiences where it was just a straight letdown because, you know, typically most places have uh, some good redeeming qualities if you look hard enough, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but sometimes it's the other factors at play that can really impact your experience. And for me, it's when locations are really busy. Uh, you know, they can basically become detached from that outdoor wilderness uh experience you know you don't have that feeling of solitude or um you know being out in the elements and you know places like horseshoe bend or antelope canyon come to mind when you think of a place like that where it's such a cool amazing natural place that is so unique and beautiful and then you know it's obviously uh being enjoyed by millions of people but the side effect is that now you've got to be there with those other people if you want to see it yourself. And I think for me, that's why I try to seek out more remote places or places that are off the beaten path. Or at least I'll go at times where I think it will be less busy. So maybe I'll go first thing in the morning. Um, but yeah, I think that's the biggest detractor for me is when you go to a place that you, you know you want to enjoy and connect with and you really can't because it's more of like a Disneyland type atmosphere. So unfortunately I think that's a byproduct of uh, social media and internet. You know now it's so easy to find every single location out there and some of these places just get completely overrun. Uh, a lot of them aren't managed at all, which is pretty unfortunate. So that's uh that's for me the biggest thing that makes it kind of a bummer when you get there and that experience is not what you anticipated. Yeah, I, I would um I would second that um that opinion. Um 
you kind of like go in and you see these photos like oh it looks like this pristine thing like the, the, i guess the thing that comes to my mind uh like the wanaka tree in new zealand it's incredibly beautiful but then you go there and you realize like oh everybody else wants this exact same shot too and so like every morning every evening uh, especially in the evening time so i mean the first time i went there i think there was about maybe 100 150 people maybe not all of them are like right on the beach you know photographers but they're just all kind of hanging out um there's even somebody peeing they brought they hauled an actual piano down down there so he's playing piano um so you, you you know the photos make it look like it's out in the middle of nowhere in the wilderness but realistically it's like it's right in town um and that you and uh, that brings up another point of like how important i think it is to not tag exactly where you are um and i something i saw in aspen recently which i was really impressed with the city they're like i forget what their their campaign was but they're basically like don't hashtag exactly where you are if you want to say aspen fine that's or, or colorado good but like don't like tag the the specific lake or mountain or trail that you're on because the next time you go back there there might be you know a thousand people at that place where before there's like nobody knew about it um so yeah i think that's i'm i'm hoping that people are are, are becoming more um in tune with that because it is it is nice when you have those special places and there are only a few people there and you really get to experience it for the way that it, it should be experienced like a, a, a piece of nature right. another location that i thought about uh i, I won't name the lake but there's a, <laughs> a backcountry lake in grand teton national park and it's got this amazing blue turquoise water uh, you look up at the peaks and it's just incredible and uh when I was there with my wife, uh, we had the place to ourselves. They only have one uh, campsite reservation each night that you can get a permit for. So we got that and we had the whole place to ourselves for that evening and the next morning. And it was just an amazing experience. But now I look online and I can see that, you know, there's thousands of people taking this place. And, uh, you know, you look at some of the pictures and you can see that they're are all these little spur trails. There's all kinds of traffic. There's people doing all kinds of things that they should not be doing in a place like that just to get some likes on social media. And, you know, that kind of stuff is really disappointing. And uh, like you said, hopefully people are becoming a little more aware of that, and more respectful. But unfortunately, I think that the reality is that there are so many people that even if it's small portion behave badly, then that can be enough to uh, either damage a place uh, to a degree that they might have to close it or uh, damage it in a way that it's no longer the pristine uh, nature spot that it was to begin with. And, you know, that's not, uh, not cool by me, so. <laughs> what lake was that? No, I'm kidding. <laughs> um, <laughs> um yeah uh sorry i had another question for you i totally forgot what it was too, too many of these <laughs> um but uh you you mentioned that you you sell your work and you sell big prints where do you where do you sell your work mainly uh well i've got a few different uh business channels i guess you could say i started selling my work online uh, about seven years ago. And that I fell under the World Explored uh, on Etsy and Amazon. And that was kind of more, I guess we could say like my B-roll type stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, images that are going to be of unique uh, places that people have been that are recognizable. Uh, so if somebody's looking for a picture of New York or uh, Mount Hood or whatever, you know, they're going to be able to find that on there. And that's all open edition stuff. Um, and that's how I got started selling. Then a few years ago, I actually decided that I wanted to get into more of the limited edition, large format, uh, really high end art, because that's what I liked doing myself. And I think that that was like, for me, the pinnacle of photography. So it's like, you know, you put in all this work, um, it's 
hours, the money, the travel, uh, all of the time spent with your post processing, all of that. And then it's just kind of a shame to let that sit online. So what I wanted to do is, uh, you know, print these so I can have them myself, but also to share those uh, images with people that, out, that are out there and want something to adorn their walls. So that's how I got started selling the big stuff. And when I say big, I'm talking anywhere from 20 to 30 to 120 inches long. Uh, like right now, I'm doing a 120 inch print of the Grand Canyon, uh, going to a collector down in Utah. So anyway, on uh, my website, that's where I sell all my large format work. And that is the only channel right now. And uh, I primarily drive traffic there just by uh, SEO and then links from uh, stories and blogs and things like this. So. Awesome. And that's maxfosterphotography.com. Um, so you're talking about print sales. Do you remember your first print and what it was? I do. So the first print that I ever sold, uh, it was a picture of Positano in Italy, uh, kind of a blue hour shot with uh, some nice lights from the, the village and we're looking out towards the sea. Um, I was actually on a ski trip in Vail, Colorado, and I heard my phone ding, and I was like, wow, I sold my first print. So I was pretty stoked on that. And uh, the rest is history. I've sold thousands of prints since then. Uh, and I love doing it because I get to do all my test prints. I get to see all the stuff, uh, how it's meant to be viewed. And uh, I, I love seeing how you know something that looks cool on a phone screen this big looks amazing when you print it uh, life size when you stand next to it and it's a solid view. So it's pretty cool. Yeah, there's something to be said about a physical print. And so I, I think most of the people here today are photographers. And so if you haven't printed before or only printed like you know four by sixes, do yourself a favor and print something rather large, even if it's like 20 by 30. Um, and it's, it's just something about having that physical print in your hand. It just like, it takes it to a, a whole new level. And it's, it's, it's almost an art form in itself, like preparing the, the, the uh, work for print to get it to come out right. Um, I, most people, uh, myself included, you know, you'll, you'll go and you'll get a print or send a print off to a printer or print it yourself and it'll come out way darker than you expected. And that's just because you're looking at a, a backlit screen. So um, it takes a little bit of practice, I think, and it's important to do some proof printing. But uh, once you get the hang of it, it's, I think it's one of the most rewarding things about being a photographer. And I'm sure you can you know, you know, relate to that as well. Yeah, absolutely. I think that doing the proof prints is just part of it. And obviously you have to make an investment to do that. But once you dial in that, print workflow and you realize I do have to you know, pump up these shadows or brighten the image overall. Uh, maybe you have to bump up the saturation or sharpen in a different method. Uh, but once you figure out how to do that, then yeah, your images are going to look great. And uh, the other key is going to be lighting your uh, photo. So you can't just print a gigantic photo and Think that it's going to look great on your wall without proper lighting so maybe that's you know putting it right next to a big window or maybe you have a spotlight that's actually meant for that artwork and uh, i think if you do that's where you're going to really uh, make that print shine so i highly recommend lighting your artwork properly 100 percent um and um, I want to give people some time for some Q&A in a little bit. I uh, just got another question or two. Um, do you have a favorite place that you've ever shopped? Uh, yeah, Alaska. Mm. Um, you know, it's one of those places where you could spend your entire lifetime exploring and traveling around and you're never going to see much compared to how big it is. So uh, my first time there was actually just last year and we went up to the Brook Range and uh, a couple friends and I did a backcountry excursion out there, came away with quite a few good shots that we were happy with. 
but just the experience of being out there, uh, you know, you're 7,500 miles from the nearest village um, with nothing but the gear on your back. And that's the way that I like to immerse myself in the wilderness and really connect with nature and uh, the place that you're at so you can just really enjoy uh, being out there. And to me, that was like the, the best experience that I've ever had photographing. And, you know, you're, you're out there and you're just one with the elements. So whatever happens, you're just in it. And uh, I think that's pretty rewarding. So definitely Alaska. There's so much to see. Uh, everything from big, jagged peaks to crazy coastlines, huge glaciers, wildlife everywhere. So Alaska for sure, my number one. Nice. That's on my my bucket list. I still haven't been up there every year. I'm like, I got I got to get up there, and I just keep keep on pushing it back. So, um, yeah. I'll have to get out there. Um, you mentioned Alaska, and you mentioned Grand Teton. Um, what's your your fear level on a scale of one to ten of grizzly bears? <laughs> uh, I guess I I don't have a big fear of uh, any kind of wildlife really. It's more a healthy respect and uh, awareness of the wildlife that's out there. So, you know, you want to make sure that whenever you're in a backcountry area like that, that you know what kind of wildlife you might encounter and how to uh, prevent as much as possible interactions that might be uh, negative. So, you know, making sure that if you're going to be camping, that you have a bear cancer, you know how to uh, either put your food in a uh, hung position or away from your camp, um, you know, so they don't come upon you and are hungry. Uh, that's really the biggest factor. And I've come across several grizzlies when I'm out uh, hiking and camping and never had a negative interaction with them. Uh, I think, you know, just making sure that you're bear aware is important and learning as much about them as possible because yeah, I mean, there's predators out there, uh, but they're not just these animals that are going to come and eat you. They're not out there to get you. Uh, you're a visitor in their home, so you know, you, you've got to understand that as well. So, I think for me, I think just uh, respecting that is important, and uh, I like to have that kind of uh, awareness that, yeah, they're, they're out there, and uh, if I get to see a bear up close, then hopefully that's going to be a good experience, not a bad one. It's kind of like like sharks. Sharks always get a bad bad rap, but realistically, you think of the millions of people that are in the ocean every year, and the attacks are, are relatively low. Same thing, same thing with 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 bears as well. Although for me anyway, it's like always in the back of my mind. Like every like thing, every like little mouse I hear outside the tent at night, like that's a grizzly for sure. Or a mountain lion come to eat me. I guarantee it. This is the last last hiking trip I ever do. <laughs> um, so my last question: limeade or lemonade? Oh, both. I think both. Ooh. <laughs> I like it together or like. <laughs> no, no. I got to keep it separate. Separate. You know, you got to have both flavors. But I like both. <laughs> I yeah I I uh, I would say too I kind of lean I think heavier towards the limeade so um um but either way uh, I don't think you can make a bad choice there so good answer um uh, well I want to open it up now if anybody I know there's a couple of you guys uh, still here um, if anybody has any questions about Max's work and what he does his workflow um, anything at all that I missed. Or if you have a question about photography in general, whether it be like, what, what camera should I buy? Or like, why do my pictures always turn out black? Um, any of those questions, feel free to ask me or Max. Uh, we can direct them towards either one of us or towards both of us. Um, so yeah, I'll go ahead and open up. If anybody has any questions, um, feel free to ask them now um, to unmute yourself. Um, you just go down to the bottom left-hand corner of the Zoom window. You should be able to unmute yourself uh, like that uh, other gentleman did a little earlier. <laughs> well, he, he knew what he was doing. Um, yeah. Like, yeah. yeah that's, I think that's somebody's pastime now is to, uh, 
just to go mess with people on zoom like like i have like i have so much trouble trying to find free time in my day i wish i had the time to just go mess with people on zoom that's amazing <laughs> like i thought it schedules out like three hours a day yeah these are the ones i'm gonna interrupt today and Oh yeah, I got the photography happy hour, and then it's uh, intro to business, and then. <laughs> yeah, so Mike, I've got a question for you. Uh, what keeps you motivated to keep shooting? What keeps me motivated to keep shooting? Um, I think the biggest thing is I'm an absolute addict. Like I'm kind of addicted, um, and I I kind of have been since since I started shooting landscape photography. When I got into photography, I was kind of doing a little bit of everything. You know, I was doing um, senior portraits and I even did wedding videos for a little while. Um, and then I, I moved to Yosemite in 2010. And that's when I really, and I did a little bit of landscape photography in Michigan, but not much. It was just like, cause I was camping and I had my camera. Um, but when I moved to Yosemite, it was kind of intentional to go out and shoot um, landscape scenes. And you don't, it's just the, the like I have always been into nature and into camping. And so to kind of marry the two of just something that I enjoy to do. And then with another thing that I really enjoy to do, it was kind of like a, a no brainer. Um, so yeah, I'm just kind of absolutely addicted. And there are times where I kind of go through these cycles and it's mostly with post-processing because with post-processing, I'm, you know, you're behind, you've done the fun stuff out, outdoors. And it's not that I don't enjoy post-processing, but sometimes I kind of get burned out of sitting behind a computer. Um, so I think the biggest thing at that point for me is to go back out and shoot more. Um, and get something that I'm really excited, something that I know is absolutely good. And then I'll be excited to process it. And once I get into that mode again, then I'll, I'll start processing other stuff. I'll start looking back um, at my like, previous years. Like, I, every year I kind of create this, this collection in Lightroom that's called Needs Work. And usually it's a couple hundred photos. And so I can always go back and like, latch onto one of those photos and, and and i actually recommend that to to everybody to go back and look at your old photos because there's a lot of times where you'll you'll be really excited you just came off a trip you're excited about that 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 piece like that your masterpiece but then you go back like a year or two later and look at it and sometimes this doesn't happen a lot but once in a while i'll find a photo that i didn't pick and that I end up processing that actually like better than the initial one that I chose. So I think that's really important to, to kind of go back and, and give you, give your chance, give yourself a chance to rest and go back and look at those, those uh, previous images. But um, yeah, just being... choose which photo you go with initially, because that's always, I find very perplexing. You kind of look for the composition, the best up front, but after you process it, you can kind of, do you know how do you choose right oh that's a great question max yeah <laughs> to be honest my biggest challenge with photography is picking what photos to edit and then actually editing them so i've got a lot of photos that i have in my portfolio but i've got about 100 times that sitting on my computer and they're all in some stage of uh, being processed and I've got different ways that I categorize them and mark them. Some are like, these are okay. These are a little better. These are the best of the best. And then these are the ones that I'm actually gonna work on. And then once I've narrowed them down like that, what I do is typically make basic adjustments in Lightroom so I can kind of see the potential of those photos. And that kind of, that makes it easier to identify those that are going to be keepers versus those that I can just keep on the hard drive. So I'll, I'll be honest, that's the hardest thing for me. And right now I've got so many photos that I feel like I'm behind on. Uh, it's almost overwhelming. So <laughs> I might not be the best person to answer that question because that's my, my weakest point. So I think you brought up a good point, Max, though. Um, I think even if it's just doing a basic adjustment, like, you know, doing some, you know, the highlights, the shadows, the, the whites and the blacks, maybe just in 
getting a really basic edit, something that just doesn't look flat that just came out of the camera, and then syncing that across your photos, at least the ones that were taken at the kind of the same time, I think that can help a lot. And then I think the other thing is kind of the, uh, the thing that I already mentioned was, say you just came off a trip, you look at the photos because you're really excited, maybe do those base edits, but then maybe give them at least a few days or a week to kind of cool off and then come back again. Try and like, when you go through that first pass, like fresh off the trip, try and pick maybe, you know, a few photos, five, 10, 15 photos that you, you like. And the way I do that, I kind of give them like a one or two star in Lightroom just to know like, okay, this is good. And if it's really, really good, maybe I'll put it at three star. And this, like my, my star ratings don't make any sense at all, just by the way, just so you, FYI. Um, but then go back and just look at those ones that you starred and then maybe like pick one or two from there to, to process. Um, and giving that, having that cool off time, I think can, can help a lot. Um, yeah, I know for me, it's also important to, come back from a trip and actually work on those photos right away because as soon as I don't do that and then I go out to another shoot and <laughs> more photos then I basically look at the photos that I took before and I'm like well I should start with these but now I want to work on these and then what I end up doing is not working on anything so <laughs> <my problem. laughs> yeah I, I, I honestly I've barely worked on anything from this year so um I've got I got a pretty good backlog of, of stuff to go back and and work on um yeah now with uh, my new baby girl it's like i have time to shower and eat and get some sleep but definitely not processing so yeah i noticed i haven't seen any photos from you a little, in, in a little while on instagram <laughs> i sense uh, J uh july 1st or something like that <laughs> yeah. i'll hold your breath on that one <laughs> another question have either one of you gone to mirrorless at all uh, yeah, uh, I, I, I've kind of got a foot in both worlds right now. I've got a, I shoot on Canon. So I got a Canon 5D Mark IV and I have the R. Um, I was planning on replacing that with the R5. Um, I just haven't gotten around to do it. The pandemic hit and that was, that made things a little bit harder uh, financially. So I still haven't made that jump, but that's the way things are going is, you know, mirrorless. So, um, I think it's it's no hurt to go in that direction because pretty soon, you know, all the manufacturers are going to stop making DSLRs um, and the and the lenses that go with them, unfortunately. Um, and honestly, I, the camera that I choose to shoot with is the one that has the lens that I need on it, because a lot of times I carry both of them in my backpack. So if if the R's got the long lens on it and that's what I need, that's what I'm shooting with. 5D's got the wide lens. That's what I need. That's what I'm. That's what I'm. I'm shooting with. How about you, Max? Uh, what are you shooting on? Yeah, I got the Nikon G7 right now. I've had that for a couple of years, and uh, overall, I like it a lot. I think that the image quality is just as good as any DSLR. You know, it's pretty comparable to the D850 in that sense. Um, biggest advantage for me is that I do a lot of outdoor hiking and backpacking and stuff like that. So the weight factor was pretty big. You know, if you're out there for 10 days and your pack weighs 60 pounds, then you don't want to have to carry 15 pounds of camera gear too. So I reduced my camera weight by over half with um, the camera and lenses. So that was huge for me. Um, and as far as durability goes, you know, it's just as good. Uh, the lenses are much more compact, which I really like. It doesn't take up much room in your backpack. Um, and I think, yeah, like you said, Mike, it's the way of the future. So that's where all the technology and uh, R&D is going to go. So I'm definitely sticking with mirrorless. Any yeah, pluses my... or minuses to using the DSLR lenses with the mirrorless, with the adapter versus other than the weight difference, obviously? But... Yeah, I actually do both. I've got some lenses that I really like that are uh, the lenses that weren't native to the mirrorless. And I just use the adapter. And you no, know, as far as image quality goes, as long as it's a lens that's uh, able to utilize autofocus and things like that uh, with the camera, then I think, yeah, it's, there's no downside really. Um, one thing that I do miss about DSLR lenses is that the focus is focused 
mechanically versus focus by wire digitally. So with mirrorless, everything is digital. The focus ring doesn't have anything attached to it. It's just a digital dial. So for me, that took some getting used to, especially when I was doing focus stacks or trying to dial in focus. Or for me, I really like using infinity focus whenever I get to a spot and I really had to get set up quickly. I could just pop it into infinity, shoot at like F13, everything's going to be in focus. You can't really do that as easily with mirrorless. I guess on the flip side though, using mirrorless technology with uh, phase detection, autofocus uh, makes it so autofocus is really good. And a lot of the uh, mirrorless allow you to tap the screen to focus and that works great. So you can just tap wherever you want and it focuses instant, instantly and that works nine times out of 10. So. Yeah, the only thing I would add to that, um, the one thing I miss um, on the mirrorless cameras is, and everyone's a little different, but the there's less buttons on them. So um, they're a little more cumbersome when I think when it comes to changing settings a little bit, at least on, on the Canon side. I, it's been a while since I've seen one of the Nikon Zs. Um, but I think they're kind of the same situation where it's just a few less buttons. So like on the 5D, I'm like, my fingers are like, there's muscle memory and they go where they need to. Like the R, I gotta like press this button. Then I gotta like cycle through between my white balance and my ISO and all these other things, which is a little more cumbersome. And there's a few programmable buttons, but I, I still want more. Um, and then as far as lenses go, yeah, I, I would agree with Max. There's not really, I mean, it's nice to use those adapters. The only downside is it, it makes the lens a little bit longer. Like the, 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 the benefit of using the, the, like the mirrorless lenses is you get this nice compact camera and lens setup once you put that adapter on. And it's not very big, but it's, it adds an extra inch and a half or so. Really not the end of the world. Um, great question though. Thank you. Uh, does anybody else have any other questions? Looks like Shana was uh, raising her hand there. I don't know if she had a question. Yeah, sorry about that. You know, I was thinking about the 600 millimeter, the new Canon lens, but then I go, oh, it's not out yet. So I was wondering if anyone had tested that one. No, um, I'm a I'm a Canon shooter, but I haven't. You're talking about the the RF lens. Yeah, the RF, the 600, uh, yeah. No, I, I don't. Um, and I've, I've been pretty sloppy on, on, on staying up to date just because I, I honestly don't, I don't even, I have a mirrorless camera, but I don't have any of the RF lenses yet. Um, but I, I do have a workshop out in um, Grand Teton and Yellowstone in the fall with Aperture Academy. And so I, I am hoping to get my hands on some sort of long RF lens to test out there. Um, I know some of their long lenses right now are really slow lenses. Um, like they're like F10 at 600 millimeters or 500 millimeters, whatever it is, um, which is kind of not, not very useful when it comes to shooting wildlife because with wildlife, you want that wide open aperture and you wanna be shooting at like F4, or F5, 6 at the, you know, at the kind of at the max. That way you can blur out that background and sometimes if you're shooting at the edge of day with a really long lens, you need as fast of a shutter speed as possible. And at, at F11, you're just not going to get that. That's so true. Um, the one I was talking about, I think it gets released um, in the fall and it, it is an F4. Oh, okay. Um, yeah. Well, if it's out and if it's rentable, because I'm sure the price tag is probably about $10,000. Um, <laughs> plus, yes. So, um, if it is out and rentable, I will try and get my paws on it. And, um, and if I do, I will write an article, um, on my, on my site about it. Um, cause I am, I, that's one of the biggest the, the kind of disappointments. Um, I'm not sure how, how Nikon is, but with, with Canon, like all of the long lenses are really slow and it, the system's been out for a little while now. So they need to like, need to up their game a little bit. Yeah, you yeah. know, I've been a shooter for as long as I've been shooting, and I think I love just about everything about them, but they are very slow at releasing new lenses, and I feel like Canon is definitely going to be doing a better job. They've already got some really killer lenses out there. One that I 
watching for that has been rumored is a 14 millimeter tilt shift. And I think that would be mm -hmm. a that would actually make me switch to Canon just because of it. Um, you know, you go out to a place like the Redwoods or something where, you know, you want to take pictures of these giant trees, but you don't want them leaning over like crazy. You know, use a tilt shift lens like that would be pretty awesome, I think. So watching out for that one. Uh, I also heard that Canon's going to be producing another uh, mirrorless R camera that is going to be uh, higher megapixel. And since I do large prints, I'm watching for that one. One thing I also looked at was the Fuji VFX 100S, which is their uh, new smaller format 100 megapixel medium format camera. Uh, biggest downside to that system is just that they don't have any lenses out yet. Uh, and another big factor for landscape shooters is that when you have a medium format uh, sensor, your depth of field is shallower, all things else being equal. So like if you're shooting at f11 on a full frame versus f11 on a large medium format sensor, then your depth of field is going to be smaller on the medium format. So that's something to consider too. Um, but I'm always looking for different high megapixel options just because I print big images. Great question. Um, are there any other questions out there? I got one from you, Mike. Sure. What's the best thing about being a photographer? Best thing about being a photographer. Who? Um, yeah, yeah, it's, it's definitely the money. <laughs> um, um, I think just the um, the fact that it makes me go out into nature and look for new stuff. Um, there, and it also, I, I here it is. It makes me get up before sunrise and watch the sunrise. I would never do that if I was not a photographer, maybe once in a while. I think the first time I ever saw the sunrise, I was, I was probably like 18 or 19 and just happened to be like driving all night long and like, oh, there's the sun rising. We were in the Everglades, like, oh, that's cool. Um, but there's no way I would get up at God awful times in the morning and watch the sunrise. Um, especially like in the summer because the days are so long um, and the sunrise is so early. So I, I think that's the best thing about, about being a, a photographer is that I get out and it, it gets me out into these beautiful places when there are nobody, when there is nobody around, you know, the crowds haven't showed up yet. And that's why I tend to, to prefer sunrises over sunsets just because of that piece. And you're like kind of watching the day come on. And you're like, oh man, this is, this is, this is, this is really was worth it. Especially when like, it's amazing, you know, when it really pays off. Right, hundred percent agree. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, if there aren't any more questions, we'll kind of wrap this thing up. Uh, thank you, everybody, for for joining. Thank you, Max, for for participating and um, being a, a wealth of knowledge. Um, for everybody. I definitely appreciate that. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, um, if you just keep an eye on naturemike.com and go to the news section, I'll, I'll, that's where I'll post the next happy hour. I don't know where or when it's going to be um, or who's going to join me, but um, as soon as I figure that out, that's where it'll be. And again, make sure you follow Max, Max Foster Photography um, on Instagram and also on his website, maxfosterphotography.com. That's right, right? Right, you got it. All right, everybody, it's been a pleasure. Um, thanks so much. And Max, come come visit me in Santa Fe. I'll be there. Thanks, Max. All right. Bye, Thank everybody. You, Thank you, Max. Santa Fe, not Oakland. Ah. Yeah, right. <laughs>